Take care, everyone. Take care. Take care. Welcome, everybody, to this minute of Awake, Minute by Minute podcast. Uh, in this minute, we're going to be looking at minute 47. Uh, and of course, uh, with myself today hosting, we have Mike and Priyank. Guys, how are, you? how are you? Priyank, how are you keeping? Good, thank you. Very good. Good. And Mike, how are you doing? Excellent. Like life in Los Angeles near yeah. Lake Shrine. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely. Good. Glad to see a lot of Priyank's hair has grown back already. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's making yeah, good yeah. progress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, good. Uh, well, good to good to be back uh, at another minute. And really, when we look at this minute, we see a continuation from the previous minute, and it's a, a really a theme of scandal uh, that continues uh, to be persisting in Yogananda's life. Um, so, in this minute, we see Robert Love uh, talking about the paranoia and lack of trust that existed in the United States in the early 20th century for foreigners, essentially non-white people. Um, and we see quite a uh, you know, theatrical show of a newspaper um, on the floor with a heading of American woman victims of Hindu mysticism. It's quite ominous uh, there. And in the picture in the front of the newspaper, we see an, an Indian figure in traditional garb uh, being the mystic, the Hindu mystic. Uh, and at his feet kneeling really is a white uh, a white woman um which uh, is is certainly interesting and i think we, we see a picture of swami vivekananda in there as well um if i'm not mistaken uh maybe you guys can't correct me on that but i, <laughs> I can't looked, remember that but i believe you i thought it looked awfully like swami vivekananda um and uh we see a, a second appearance i think um of stephanie simon uh, she appeared in minute 29 uh, she's an author uh, she talks about a uh, the uh, miscegenation laws, uh, uh, and that really means uh, that they had been forbidden at the time uh, for whites and non-whites to marry. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and at the end, uh, which we'll talk for the most part uh, in this minute, uh, we see some amazing footage of Yogananda marrying two devotees, one brown and one white. So that is the minute. Uh, so we'll talk um, firstly about the scandal. Uh, and that is just to paint the picture and provide some context. Uh, we're looking at the miscegenation laws uh, that were enforced at the time uh, in the 1920s. Uh, and that was racial segregation at the level of marriage. Uh, and, and that's uh, you know any intimate relationships. Um, and that really criminalized interracial marriage uh, and sometimes also sex between different members of different races. So it was pretty, pretty hardcore, um, not that long ago as well, you know, only 100 years. So, you know, it's a good um, reminder of history and where we've come from. Um, some more detail here. Most of the states in, in the United States uh, had laws um, by 1967 um, uh, on, on this topic uh, and that was the U U the US Supreme Court that ruled in Loving versus uh, versus uh, Virginia um, that such laws were unconstitutional so it really wasn't some time after you know Yogananda uh, had uh, been seen in this footage marrying to devotees um, that such laws were overturned uh, and they were overturned in remaining 16 states. So, so that hopefully set some scenes of what Yogananda was up against. Um, and it was extremely heated at the time. Um, Priyank, do you want to jump in? Yeah, it was heated at the time. And in a lot of countries, it still is heated, isn't it? There's still some debacles in some countries where you're not allowed to marry certain interreligiously and uh, intergenderly inter and all other all sorts of other issues so st we're still not uh, free from that plight um so the influence of these images and this part of the film no doubt has some relevance even today yeah mike <clears throat> i i was always wondering um because when, when you read about apartheid in south africa segregation in america where where does this actually come from what is the fear that people have when they when they um, intermingle 
between different races? Do they feel like they look like that? There's this idea of the being like, um, uh, I don't know, pure or something. But I, I feel like people um, thinking they're losing something when there is some interracial um, uh, marriages going on. They're losing their culture or something, or they have another culture that mixes in, and then in the end, it will be different than before. I was always wondering why, where this comes from, why people would come up with this idea in the first place. A good question. I actually thought, in some ways, it's quite basic, um, mm. and it's for me, you know, a state of ignorance and duality, seeing things as opposites, and seeing somebody of different color to you that maybe behind that had different cultures so maybe even smelt different you know they, they had a different way about them there's a distrust of that differentiation uh, i suppose the, the lack of knowledge breeds ignorance uh, and it's kind of kind of simple in some ways you know it's almost um looking back uh in time you can somewhat sympathize with people because they mightn't have ever seen it before and humanity at that time was more under a state of ignorance than what we are today so there is that deep trust distrust, distrust of the unknown uh, and that is very kind of deep rooted psychological fear that i think humans have um, or have had certainly in our past history uh Priyank. yeah and it's a it's a it's a particular topic of interest amongst academics as well like and also general observers like you know Hitler's autobiography was it Mein Kampf is how you, how you say it that okay. that part which discusses this you know his 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 crazy ideas on racial purity and things like that they're still it's still it's still very well like looked up and people still read about it so it's still there's still a lot of you know um, learned circles trying to work out how that theory you know, is evolving even now. There was a famous scientist, um, well, well, we don't need to get too deep into it. <laughs> um, I think his name is Kunt, um, and I think he was Scottish. And he, as along with one other scientist, propagated the um, scientific reasons as to why the races were different and why the whites were superior and so on and so forth and it was all bogus really but that was actually uh taken up uh, by many at the time um and they were very they're very well known uh, in these circles um to, to really try to bring some you know legitimacy to some really deep states of ignorance that really that existed at the time so i guess that people ran with a lot of these um a lot of these findings that and uh, one other scientist put forward um, at, at the time, I think it was in the 19th century. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a deep-seated, uh, very complex issue. Uh, but thankfully, um, we've, we've shown uh, in science that uh, there isn't uh, much <laughs> between, between us um, when you peel away the skin. Uh, well, one thing that I did want to sort of mention was you know, in the picture, uh, I said that there was a woman kneeling at the feet of this Hindu mystic. Uh, and I, I thought it, was, it, it struck me as funny because it's a sign of devotion in India uh, to kneel at one's feet and to kind of pranam and, you know, touch the feet of a guru. Uh, but here it's seen, I think, or it's depicted as a way of uh, submissive act. Mm. Uh, and I thought that was really striking to me that one culture might see that as really submissive and almost oh look you know that they've, they've been hypnotized and they're falling at the feet of these men uh you can just think of the the, the way that they would describe that versus what in india that they would see that as. um so yeah lots uh lots there too but was it um was it so seen as demeaning anyway to wash to christ's feet for example mm -hmm. was it not seen as a privilege or an honor yeah uh, yeah, 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 there's a famous story of that. I think there was something similar in the autobiography of a yogi, if maybe I'm mistaken, but um, yeah, it's, it's, seen, it's seen as uh, taking care of uh, one's, uh, as, as another, as you would for oneself, isn't it? I think that's the, the story where that goes. Um, 
certainly this is like a very there's a clash of cultures here isn't there where you know, you know you've got uh, something so revered and um, so widely done in India is just very alien in the United States at the time uh, so there's a lot of mistrust there's a lot of unknowns misunderstandings um, that really came into play Mike yeah I think you're right um, because the <clears throat> the whole <clears throat> the whole idea of bowing in in India in front of a guru is so common right and most people that grow grow up in India have a guru of some sort right and um, for them like showing reverence to the guru by by kneeling touching his feet touching their forehead is super normal and then in the west I feel like it was more like misappropriated by kings and by rulers and it basically has a different meaning it doesn't mean I, I show reverence to you it means like you bow before me because I'm your ruler right so it's the same gesture but it's seen differently in in different places and I guess that's also a big misunderstanding there interestingly um, your parents are said to be your first gurus so you you have to until you find a guru guru then you would bow to your feet to the feet of your parents as well and we still do like even at um, weddings or something you touch the feet of your parents mm. Very cool we're, we'll, we'll get into the subject of, of uh, weddings actually in, in just a moment um but uh yeah so, so this is the thing really the scandal uh you're going to have to essentially put up with uh, and i'm sure he would have been more more aware of this uh, than others given his um, uh, situation um we have stephanie simon here talking about um reading between the lines you can see what the problem is that there's uh you know a period of this um forbidden marriage between white and non-white skinned uh, and they didn't want to mix the races. Uh, so she, she kind of solidifies that quite nicely. Uh, and in the next scene, we see uh, this beautiful scene of a wedding. Uh, so let's, let's delve into that um, now. So there, this is uh, taken from a longer video of these clips. So we see video footage of Yogananda uh, with a congregation, really, um, of people who were uh, gathered for ceremony uh, of this of this uh, uh, wedding between two devotees and we see some instruments being played we see uh, you know people of different races in there which is really really cool to see uh, and Yogananda is um, uh, giving them blessings these to uh, this couple uh, so he's putting his hand on their uh, the tops of their head uh, and uh, chanting om amen om and he's saying how this is symbolical uh, this marriage uh, for the break, breaking of the barriers between the brown Caucasians of India and the white Caucasian of America. Um, and there's a couple funny moments in it. I, I thought that, you know, he, he realizes he's holding flowers uh, uh, and he kind of drops them quickly before he kind of, you know, goes to give the blessings and <laughs> the man holding an instrument that he's playing. Uh, of course, it's traditional to the SRF. Um, uh, instrumental uh, uh, orchestra, but uh, yeah, there, there's there's a lot in there to unpack. Uh, but I wanted to come to somebody first that knows a little bit more about the um, weddings, Priyank, uh, or the SRF the most. You had a wedding yourself through the SRF. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the purpose. You know, why would somebody get married through the SRF and uh, YSS? Yeah, so firstly there, um, well, I can only speak for Hindu weddings. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ritual, a lot of, I dare say the word clutter in terms of the ceremony. Um, I mean, you know, the prayers and stuff are quite deep, but there's a, there's a lot of, if you've ever been to a Hindu wedding, there's a lot of elements where people don't really know what they're doing they just they've just they're just doing it because that's the way and there's like little bit you know little done that's exchanged that, that's like you know uh, during parts of the ceremony money is money is exchanged between the groom's family and the bride's family between like the youngest son and all that would be the youngest brother if, if, if there is one and the uncles and all sorts of 
really, really um, quite detailed and quite um, uh, quite distracting rituals, I would say. But the SRF ceremony is completely devoid <laughs> of ritual. It really goes to goes to the heart of just what a marriage should be. What should it what it should mean for your spiritual growth? Um, so uh, you know, I'll, I'll just take you through some of the holy vows that are given by Paramahansa Yogananda that for, for marriage that uh, my wife and I had, for example. Um, they, they start with things like, I am thine, thou art mine, that we may merge in God. Body, mind and soul we cast into the flame of love to be purified into cosmic love for all the mankind. We are united by spirit first and by emotional liking, intellectual affinity and physical attraction secondarily. We will merge our desires for the highest common good. We will cooperate with each other that we may harmonize with the laws of truth. We will love each other unconditionally. Through our love, we will forgive each other always. Even death shall not sever the bond of friendship, which through marriage we establish in God. We will be loyal to each other to demonstrate our capacity for divine loyalty. May we care for each other unselfishly, ever increasingly, until our love becomes the love of God. We are united to fulfill the law of creation and through mutual love to find the infinite divine love. We aspire to bring souls on earth to worship God in newborn forms. May our children serve as spiritual ushers to bring other souls back from delusions home into the eternal freedom in God. May our souls join the one spirit of God. So you can see there's, um, there's a lot, a lot, every single vow in there. There's a lot of, lot of depth and real, it goes to the core of life and spirituality. And we'll, in a minute, we'll play um, part of, uh, part of those vows that were played in this, um, in this video that uh, that was part of the minute that you're going to end the ceremony but yeah we, you know, interesting to hear your your feedback guys on those vows that's probably the first time you've had is mike do you want to jump in yeah i can do i mean i've i've seen that i've seen them before but um not um read out to me like that um but I've, they are very beautiful in the sense that i feel like they Every single vowel is super significant and hits the spot exactly, right? And some of them, like for example, when they when it says like even after death you maintain friendship in God, right? So it, it just means okay, if you're if this life this life is over, your marriage also ends with your life because it's kind of till death do us part kind of thing, right? But then you still have a, a connection of of love afterwards in the in maybe following incarnations even which is super interesting and then the, the responsibility of um so when you have children you actually want to bring in um uh, souls who worship god and you want them to usher um other people out of delusion which is like a super super strong responsibility as well so it's a lot of a lot of big big vows in there Maybe you can give some of, the, some of the nuts and bolts on this as well. There's two deputies getting married in the uh, video that we watched, and we'll, we'll watch a bit more of it in a minute. Um, the two people who are getting married through the SRF, do they both have to be devotees, or is it at least one, or can anybody? So what happened with me? Um, so it was a very personalized affair for myself. So bro um, Brother Balananda did my ceremony with my wife and he interviewed me before the wedding before the ceremony and said you know talked asked me about my practices and my wife's practices and they tailored interestingly they tailored the vows for us so for example we didn't read the he asked me what our intentions were for you know raising family um, which is, I know that's uh, some some people may find that a strange question, but it was a very relevant question for us because my wife and I don't intend to have 
children well we didn't then well, we still don't um so we we didn't um read out the vow which was we aspire to bring souls on earth to worship in to worship god in newborn forms or may our children serve as spiritual ushers to bring other souls back from delusions home into the eternal freedom in god so we didn't read out those vows because they weren't relevant for us but there was another couple obviously they they did want a family life and they did read those out so um yeah it, it's very um personalized and yeah essentially both of you have to be members um probably less than students um um i, I can't remember if you, one of you has to be a greer one i don't think so but uh, i could stand to be corrected on that like and you um you were obviously married already right when yes that's you right, yeah. wedding, right so that's right. um I, i think in the us you can actually get married like the, the the srf way and then make turn it into a legal marriage um yeah, I'm, not sure that, i'm not sure if that's how it works in europe or other countries as well well they actually he, he i think because the monks are only in london for you know for a week or whatever or when they come around they they don't want to go through any of that <laughs> those hurdles so they ask that you're already married um right. or court registered and then you can undertake this ceremony and you know for for myself uh, i mentioned all the clutter surrounding the rituals in my traditional hindu wedding which was in india um but you know this was just such a breath of fresh air because i i'm so anti-ritual <laughs> that it's unreal oh, i wonder why i was brought into an indian uh, household perhaps to overcome such a uh, stronger versions but um but yeah this this is just there's no rituals it's just a beautiful ceremony that really goes to the core of what the purpose of a union should be forwarded trying to get mine done in the next couple of years myself um so do we now i want to talk about it. who who actually is it we're looking at in this yeah, video? <clears throat> yeah let's just before that now let me just play you a clip because this is actually a much longer clip and before we talk about who's in it um let's just this is so those vows that i read out they're different um quite different actually to the vows that you're going to conduct in this ceremony so let me just read or play you what um a part of the first part of before the vows are exchanged and then i'll give you some context as to why this video was done and i'll explain a bit about it afterwards and then we can talk about the two people that are getting married themselves because of which there's a long and checkered history um but we'll, we'll just let me play you that All right. These minds and aspirations and souls for the pursuance of one common goal of final spiritual liberation. Remember, greater than man-made laws and ceremonies is the sacred ceremony of your spontaneous determination to keep your hearts and souls united to a common great purpose thus understanding your high spiritual purpose in seeking a spiritual union i do hereby bless and unite the spirit of your souls thus also recognizing your desire to seek a proper companion who can assist you in this spread of the super art of living the message of yagoda i do hereby unite you in spirit of god and now it's play the end bit um which is quite nice there's a little kirtan you remember this Thank you. 
pretty epic yeah there's a lot to unpack in there so what we'll do is i'll post on on the description i'll post the video file to the, the link to the file for the whole of that video which is about 12 minutes long and um, firstly you you'll have noticed that the vowels were different um, to the ones that i read out now and then you should also notice that but they, i think in essence they were quite similar there was a lot of you know core spiritual um, philosophies that were that were in there and then you'll notice that there were some extremely strangely dressed people and then there were some musicians that looked like they had or played like they had never played an instrument before in their lives and that is probably the case because the history surrounding this is quite varied but this this video was actually the whole proceedings was staged um, and it was a it was a, a marriage that had occurred between these two individuals and we'll discuss them in a minute but they after their wedding the actual you know court registered wedding they conducted this at LA or near mother center or somewhere in LA and they invited you know newsreels to record it as in because in California as Chris mentioned um, interracial marriages weren't allowed so th this wedding actually took place in New Mexico and then they did this you know, elaborate ceremony, and they would have hired, you know, some professional cameras and professional audio equipment, because this, this video potentially, I think, is probably the, the best video and audio that we have of Guruji. Um, I could stand corrected, um, and if people have seen better, then do let me know, but this is a 12-minute video where you can hear Yogananda and see him so clearly, isn't it? Um, yeah. So I thought that was you. Have you guys got any uh, thoughts on that, Mike? <clears throat> Mostly questions. <laughs> so yeah. when, I, when I saw this video, I mean, a lot of questions we're going to ask. Uh, we're going to talk about like who is going getting married, and you already mentioned that they already they actually got married in New Mexico. <clears throat> um, but um, they staged it. What was the purpose of that video? Was it like some kind of advertisement for the cause? Or, I mean, if it's illegal, like I can imagine this video might have sparked some anger amongst people who see it, right? Like what, is, what was the purpose of the video? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, so you're going to join them. This is spiritually at Mother Center. Um, and this, 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 you're going to say the marriage symbolized breaking down the barriers between, as said in the film, the brown Caucasians of India and the white Caucasians of America. So that is the reason. So, and then apparently they even played this footage in theaters. <laughs> wow. So, so they're actually, they're not just breaking them down, but they're promoting that they need to be broke down, not just in terms of the law, but primarily into the thoughts, minds, and hearts of the general populace. Yeah, Chris. Listening to Yogananda speak here, it, it is an amazing bit of footage, and I think you're probably right, it's the best long chunk of footage that we have on Yogananda. Um, you can see his eyes, you know, rolling to the yeah. top, and he's, he's uh, clearly, you know, going to a space uh, and speaking from that space, and he's, um, it's just really awesome to see, uh, you know, from my perspective, um, I thought that that was that was uh, something noteworthy, Greg. Yeah, and so much, you're so right, and so much personality comes out when you can see uh, that video um, and see a long version of it, even like, even things like, you know, him ushering people along or how he talks to people that, you know, when he needs something done or if someone's doing something incorrectly, like that lady, for example, who was playing that drum on a few occasions, she she was doing it completely incorrectly and he was, he was trying to encourage her to play at the right you know tempo <laughs> it was quite funny so so many elements of like that personal uh, what it would have been like to be with Guruji come out of that video it was just a phenomenal I'm so glad we did this podcast otherwise I wouldn't have uh, even found that video 
Mike. Yeah, and like you said, uh, some people are are like um, dressed in strange robes in there. Like uh, this person to the right with the like the headband and all white. And is that do you think to promote like interculturalism um, in the video? I'll tell you exactly what it is. Apparently, two colorful characters joined the yoga the lecture circuit during those years, as yoga and ratcheted up the showmanship, no doubt in, re in response to the economic conditions. Mm. At the time, what little money Americans could spare was likely to be spent on escapist entertainment than for edifying philosophy or self-improvement. Hence, uh, there was a Hamid Bey who was invited to give mind power demonstrations and lecture under Yogananda's auspices. Most appearances were solo, but sometimes the miracle man was the opening act for Nirodhi and or Yogananda. And dressed in Arabian garb, he stuck long pins through his tongue, stopped wow. his pulse on command, reclined on spikes, had large rocks smashed on his chest, and allowed himself to be buried in a casket of seemingly impos impossible stretches of time. Um, some, of, some of the ads for Yogi Hamid Bey, divine magnetic healer and miracle man of the Orient, indicated that whilst Bay was buried alive, Yogananda would speak on topics such as magnetic vibratory healing and what happens 10 minutes after death. <laughs> so uh, this is probably that chap, or if not, they made it dress like that chap. Um, <laughs> quite funny, isn't it? He's got a good beard. I like that. <laughs> and, then, and if you look, there's also because of the, uh, the nature of the purpose of the film, i.e. the interracial harmony. There's like oriental person there, there's um, lots, of, lots of Indians, there's this Arabic looking man, there's a guy with a turban on the right. Um, and then there's, there's all sorts, all sorts and uh, all sorts, isn't there? Everything seems to be covered. An eclectic, uh, yeah, group. Uh, it looks looks amazing and let's jump into who the devotees are then um i think yes. again, again, Frank, you have uh, something to yes i do so he is this chap who's in there um i must say quite a he just by his demeanor he looks very nervous to me <laughs> he looks a bit shady <laughs> and it certainly turns out to be yeah mike do you want to come back straight away on that yeah, yeah, because he, like you notice when the, the vowels are read, everyone is like looking somewhere and he's like looking straight into the camera <laughs> all the time with a smile. <laughs> Maybe he, he's got some Hollywood training or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, apparently he's a fellow Bengali, Nirad Ranjan Choudhury is his name. Chandri, Chand Choudhury grew up around yogis and was well versed in yogic philosophy and practices. He was a graduate from Calcutta University and he came to US to study Sanskrit at Berkeley and then into Harvard. And whilst in Cambridge in 1923, he received Kriya initiation from Yogananda. And by 1926, he was working for Ford in Detroit. And when Yogananda came to town, Chaudhary said in a letter dated 1926, he wanted to be made a brahmachari. So he became Brahmachari Sri Nerode, um, and he stated a desire to work for Yogananda under the standard conditions of a renunciant employment, i.e. room and board and basic expenses. And to simplify his name for Americans and to designate his commitments, Chaudhary became Brahmachari Sri Nerode. And um, Yogananda immediately made him, interestingly, the, the leader at the Detroit Center, um, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, Mike? Um, I mean, the, the question uh, immediately springs to mind, right? He's uh, asking to be a brahmachari in order to become a monk, right? Yeah. And now we see him getting married. How does, yeah. this, how does this work together? Yeah, so when we get to their wedding, so what actually happened was that, um, well, firstly, yeah, you, you don't tend to, um, you don't tend to go from brahmachari back to um back to normal life you go on to the next stage which is become a sannyasi which is a complete renunciant i.e a brother or a swami but um he obviously for whatever reason decided that he wanted to be get married um and um and then at that point they yeah they dropped his name but interesting let, let me explain who that other person 
is um, on there. Uh, the other person is a lady called um, Agnes Spencer, who is a young Coloradan uh, who moved to LA to attend a UCLA. And at one point, money being tight, she took a job at Mount Washington typing for Yogananda's manuscripts. She returned to school and subsequently ran into the ch her chum named Gladys Weber. And Gladys Weber, who had worked at Mother Center, arranged a blind double date for two gentlemen from India, i.e. Swami Tirananda and Brahmachari Sri Nirote. Now, why this Gladys lady would arrange a blind date for two renunciants? And <laughs> heaven only knows. But you'd imagine that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't have been coerced into going on a blind date. They would have um, shown Gladys an inclination that they want to um, <laughs> wanted to get married. But apparently Glad, um, Gladys was um, legally married to an Indian filmmaker who moved back um, to India with his wife. Um, so, so she was married, but then they got divorced in 1934 and then married Swami Dhirananda, who then resumed his original name, Bar Basu Kumar Bhakti. And then the Narodes married and Agnes married in 1931. So this would have been in 1931, this video footage. He, Brahmachari Sri Narod was 44 and she was 24. So quite young. And then, you know, at that time of marriage, they obviously um, stopped that uh, Brahmachari name. So he just became Sri Narod and Sri obviously means the great one. Um, shall I go through a little bit of the history of um, Nerode now? Because what happened, it turned very sour. <laughs> Yes, please, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what happened was apparently um, after Dhirananda um, left the, you know, left the organization, uh, your Guruji invited Nirode from the Detroit to LA to apparently um, Nirode had been named the residential leader at yoga, the headquarters, and that Dhirananda had gone away for a period of rest and study, which is apparently the Swami equivalent for an unpopular politician leaving the office to spend more time with his family. <laughs> so <laughs> Swami Dhirananda left out one door and uh, Sri Nirode came in the other, um, which is um, not, not, not really, didn't really work out well, did it? So Dhirananda didn't work out well. And then Nirode, I'll tell you what happened. So um, when, when, when they came to LA, after what appears to have been cheerful beginning, they bring things gradually downhill um between Yogananda's relationship they became quite testy apparently there was the issues were mainly about finances accommodation and uh, friction between the other residents um at one point Nerode's weekly maintenance remittance was reduced as were those for all of everyone at the center because of the depression um and the families had to move from their rooms on the second floor to a smaller darker space at the bottom level <laughs> bottom level apparently Agnes didn't like this uh, and so yeah, there was lots of um, issues surrounding you know their living arrangements and they weren't happy um, and then what happened was that Nerodes were ousted in 1939 um, the official notice of termination cites multiple reasons um, it was but then Sri Nerodes filed a lawsuit against Yogananda um, under the LA Superior Court, under his original name, i.e. Niradharan Ranjan Chaudhary. Um, and he claimed that Yogananda was based on an oral agreement that they, was, they were supposed to split their share of the fortunes, apparently. And now he did move to dissolve the support, part the support supposed partnership and obtain his share, which he claimed to be $500,000, which is $8 million today, Mike. Yeah, it's funny that we see like a pattern there between Dhirananda yeah. and Sri Naroda, right? Yeah. And then you have to ask yourself why. And one good point uh, that Phil Goldberg makes there is that it was in the middle of the Great Depression, mm. right? So it was probably really hard to make money. And then I don't know if that's true, but maybe a little bit um, the kind of uh, goals of a renunciant and the goal of a family, they go out, they contradict yeah. each other a little bit, right? Yeah. Because as a family, you want to build up yourself and become financially stable and, and provide for your wife and those kind of things or provide for your partner. 
and um, as a renunciant, you just do whatever <coughs> the guru asks you. And if they lived in the nice room and now they have to rent out the nice room because they need money, then then so be it, right? Like, so I feel like there was this conflict of interest in them. And um, like with Dirananda, Guruji kind of felt um, compassion for Dirananda, even when he sued him, right? Because he said he he's now in America and he needs money and <laughs> to for his um, to start his endeavors. And I'm guessing it is similar here. I'm not I'm not excusing suing your guru like <laughs> it's completely inexcusable in my opinion. But but um, but it, the, there were diff difficult circumstances that pushed him that way as well. Mm -hmm. One of one of the um, things that uh, we saw in the previous minute, uh, Yogananda said was, you know, you can kind of see it in people's minds that, that all people are thinking about are the bills that they have to pay, and uh, you know maybe maybe money he could see money was swirling around the minds of people more in in the U.S. because of the materialism and the the hobbies and things that the distractions that people were picking up. Um, Versus living a life of simplicity, and I, I like your point, Mike. I think, you know, the the um, the goals uh, and the needs that uh, maybe a family group would have had versus what Yogananda was saying not to do would have been very different. Um, and uh, yeah, thankfully we can see now in hindsight how it played out, and Yogananda's you know intents and what he was really building, versus you know what maybe you were depicting there, maybe more of a money grab and you know. You could never imagine him saying, okay, let's just split the fortunes and, you know, run away into the distance or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, we have that hindsight looking back now. It's, it's a lot more clear. Yeah. And then apparently the court, uh, the court wrangled on for more than a year, but uh, in the end of 1940, um, Judge Ingle found, Ingle Ball found no basis for the partnership, um, even if the, in concept, even if the concept of partner had any real meaning in a non-profit corporation, he said. Um, apparently, more to the point, in 1929, in the aftermath of the Dhirananda debacle, Sri Rode had signed a document stating that he was then, was then called the Yogoda Satsang Society, will be in no way responsible for paying me a salary, and I'm giving up my service of my own accord without any remuneration or compensation other than provided me by the local centre. So yeah, and then it, it did get ugly and various, you know, claims and false witnesses and oh, it was uh, it was a bit crazy. Um, but we do, I think we can we can leave it there because um, yeah, but he did not win. Essentially, let's let's leave it at that. <laughs> we, hindsight's twenty twenty nine. Um, it is amazing. I think I said in the previous minute. Uh, I had to eat my words. Uh, that I sort of spoke too quickly. Uh, that Yogananda. If he hadn't, uh, I wasn't aware of some of the troubles that he had been through and the challenges that he had been through. But I, I think it just speaks um, and ages well with time, as we've mentioned before, how he doesn't really dwell on sort of the problems. He, he wants to focus on the simplicity of life. Um, so yeah, it's good. It's good that they covered these things loosely in in the minute, um, in the way that they did. Uh, they haven't dwelled on it too much. So nor should we. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 important. Well, it has it it had ramifications for self-realization fellowship even to this day. Apparently, like you know, there was like you know previously we talked about the sex, the claims of like you know, um, Yogananda having extra you know affairs with women or whatever, uh, not not um, not holding to his vows of celibacy. Um, so like apparently, for example, um, he claimed that. Um, uh, Guruji uh, would have women that go up to see him at crazy hours, uh, but it doesn't stay. He didn't say that men also came to see him, and that Guruji never slept. So he had meetings through the day. And like, if like if there's a fifty people living in that house at Mount Washington, if there was something crazy happening, everyone would know about it. And apparently, um, the legal battles between SRF and Ananda Church of SRF which is, you know, the um, Swami Kriyananda's organization. Um, Faye writes, I, Daya Mata, had to, she went under oath many years later saying that 
nothing crazy like that happened with me nor anyone that I knew. So even after 50 years after his passing and that court case went from 1990 to 2002, they still have to suffer the ramifications of this insanity, you know, this that Swami Dhirananda and the Brahmachari Sri Nirod or Sri, let's just call him, uh, what's his name, Chaudhary. <laughs> Nira Chaudhary, I think that's what we should refer to him as. He does not deserve a Sri next to his name, nor a Brahmachari next to his name. Well, yeah, harsh but fair, uh, mm. I think, uh, there, Priyank, yeah. Um, so that's that's really that minute, really. You know, it's a continuation from the scandal from the previous minute. Uh, and really, we're looking forward. Uh, we do go into more depths uh, again uh, on uh, the various challenges. I think Yogananda uh, really was going through some of the biggest challenges of his life. So we will delve into this in a little bit more detail in the next minute. Phil, um, Phil Goldberg, before we end it, um, Phil Goldberg, um, if you open the last card on there, guys, um, he did an analysis, an independent analysis of all the allegations and claims of, you know, miss, you know, in not acting properly on, the, on, on behalf of Yogananda and, and he, he, wrote, he wrote this as a conclusion after reviewing all the evidence. He said, um, firstly, he said, uh, what did he say? That, um, firstly, he said that, um, the, about that whole, he said, uh, I've examined all of the evidence and communicated with individuals who have devoted considerable time to accumulating Yogananda-related materials. Had I found ver ver verifiable evidence that Yogananda had sexual affairs or exploited female disciples, I would not have hesitated to report it, but I did not. I found hearsay, inter inference, speculation, and a handful of statements from a few people who were in Yogananda's orbit at the time, but whose objectivity would have been considered questionable, i.e. <laughs> um, Nirad Chaudhary. But yeah, so can someone read that last? Um, this is a good card, I think, to end on. Yep. Um, before we leave this delicate subject, we must ask why it is that people get so exercised about the per uh, perpetrated uh, sex lives of spiritual leaders. One reason is that we tend to place them on pedestals so high that many of them would rather not climb on board. The veneration not only sets up followers for disappointment when the gurus turn out to be human, as they all are, it also invites backlash, as some people love to topple pedestals as much as others love building them. Portraying gurus as godlike also denies them the credit they deserve for growing, learning, maturing, and evolving as human beings. Yogananda said, that a saint was a sinner who didn't give up. Who, uh, we can't possibly know what inner struggles he may have kept to himself on his way to be sanctified, to, uh, to the sanctified status that was eventually bestowed upon him. But if we did know, would the spiritual principles he articulated so well be any less true? Would his Kriya Yoga be any less effective? He asked people to examine his ideas with rigor and to practice his methods with diligence. He did not ask to be turned into an object of worship. He said many times in many ways, I am not the guru, God is the guru. I am God's servant. He also said after my passing, the SRF teachings will be the guru. Very nice. Yeah, nice, uh, nice words from Phil, Phil Berg there. Um, made me, it made me think, you know, when you look at the video, that we have there in the 12 minutes that we, as Frank says, we'll share in the link. Um, how great a blessing it would have been to be with him at that time. And you can see, as Frank says, uh, some of the mannerisms and, you know, you can see his maybe humor as well. Uh, uh, you can see him orchestrating everybody <laughs> at that point saying, you know, in the video, there's the, 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 when they're marching, he's saying like, stop, you know, stop here. And, <laughs> Uh, you know, because the, the camera was on him, <laughs> he, was, he was having to deal with so many things and really building the uh, foundations of SRF from the ground up. So it's an amazing bit of footage. Um, so yeah, awesome that we can delve into it in a little bit more detail in this minute. Um, but with that said, uh, does anybody have anything else that they would like to go into before no. we round off the minute? Mike, all good? Well, with that, thank you very much for joining us and we'll look forward to uh, discussing Minute 48. Yeah, 
Take care. Take care.